We're going to do the first sort of intro lecture. Um, you'll notice as we go through that the lectures get shorter and shorter and you spend more and more of your time doing the hands-on stuff. So this is probably the lecture that tends to take the most time, I would say, of all of them. Uh, and usually that's because there are kind of questions or discussion that goes um, along the way, uh, which is great. So if you guys uh, have questions or comments, then please free to, feel free to, to shout them out as we go. Um, and if not, then we'll get done the lecture faster. Um, it's really up to you guys. So this is really just a just kind of a general intro, so it's not a lot of sort of really hardcore bioinformatics in this lecture. Uh, it's really the sort of basic introduction to RNA sequencing. We're going to work our way through each of these modules, and then each one has a corresponding hands-on tutorial. The sort of high-level goal of these tutorials is to provide one reasonable working example of an RNA-seq analysis pipeline. So some of you have already been working with some RNA-seq tools or perhaps have kind of a draft version of a pipeline you've been working with. This one will undoubtedly be different in some ways, so you can compare to it. If you haven't started yet at all, then this pipeline hopefully could be the basis for the, the start of the analysis that you actually do on your data, and you could modify it to your purposes uh, using this as a, a starting point. For the purposes of the actual tutorial we're going to do, uh, everything needs to run in a reasonable amount of time with fairly modest compute resources so that things can happen in a sort of educational setting like this. So for that reason, we have sort of downsampled data sets that are smaller than the sort of actual size of data that you would be dealing with uh, for human. Uh, but all of the commands are basically the same. They just don't take as long to run. Uh, and whenever there are sort of discrepancies from what you would do with sort of a real large data set, we sort of try to draw attention to those, uh, those differences. And then finally, we want it to be really kind of self-contained, self-explanatory, and portable. So all of this is going to blast past you guys pretty quickly, uh, and you'll do your best to follow along. But inevitably, some of the details will start to sort of fade away pretty quickly after the, the course. So the goal is that you can refer back to the materials, and hopefully everything that you need to understand what was going on in, in the classroom here will be fairly obvious. Uh, and uh, another kind of goal was that nothing will be kind of hidden from you. So this is a common failing of, of some workshops is that uh, some complex environment is set up uh, and everything kind of works and then you go back to your own lab and you try to do it and it's sort of like, well, I don't know how to create that complex environment. The tools were all installed and I don't know how to install them. I don't know what versions were used and so forth. So we try our best to avoid that by basically explaining all of the tools you use, show you how to install the tools, and it, in theory you should be able to recreate the exact workflow uh, that's here. And everything is, is published on it, this open wiki so that you, don't, you should be able to run through the entire workshop without actually uh, being here. And if you have problems with that, you can you know, submit a, a GitHub issue to the, the Git repo for the, the wiki for this course. And we, we do get quite a few people who just come across it on the internet and they work their way through the workshop on their own. Uh, and they're able to get it to work. So we think that we're succeeding uh, in this goal. Um, but please do let us know if you encounter any problems. So the learning objectives for this, this first lecture or first module uh, is really just a basic introduction to the theory and practice of RNA sequencing. Um, we're going to go over the, the rationale for RNA sequencing, which I'm sure for many of you is, is pretty obvious. Um, we're going to talk about uh, some challenges uh, specific to RNA sequencing that you wouldn't encounter, say, in some D of the DNA sequencing approaches, some general goals and themes of the RNA-seq analysis workflow. So there's some, a lot of different RNA-seq tools uh, and workflows that combine different combinations of those tools, but they do have some sort of fundamental themes to them uh, that are sort of useful to think about and, and learn. Um, some of the common technical questions that relate to RNA-seq analysis, uh, some tips on getting help outside of the course. Anne's already done a great job of sort of pointing you at resources to, to work through uh, on your own if you get stuck on something. Uh, and then we'll do a brief introduction to the, the hands-on tutorial itself just to kind of uh, prime you for what's going to happen uh, at the command line. So this you're probably all quite familiar with, but just to make sure we're all on, on the same page, this is a sort of a simple cartoon diagram I created some years ago uh, providing an overview of, of the central dogma. Uh, so the basic idea is that you start with a double-stranded gen genomic DNA template uh, depicted at the top here, uh, which is uh, 
uh, depicting a sort of very uh, simple uh, gene example where we have three exons uh, and two introns. Uh, for human, this is of course not to scale. So in human, uh, the the exons are much smaller relative to very large introns. This almost looks like more like a yeast gene. Um, we have a promoter region here. Uh, the first uh, five prime uh, UTR, uh, a transcript initiation site. Then the first intron, exon two, uh, and then a transcript termination codon, uh, polyidation, polyadenylation signal. Uh, so this thing uh, gets uh, transcribed from the DNA uh, into single strand. Uh, pre-mRNA molecule, uh, where the introns are still in place. And now we have a, a sort of a different set of regulatory features that govern how uh, splicing will remove these introns and stitch the exons together. So we have donor sites, acceptor sites, um, and exonic uh, splicing enhancers and silencers, and intronic splicing enhancers and silencers. All of these things sort of control how the splicing machinery comes in, identifies the introns, and connects the exons together. Uh, and this gives us a mature mRNA molecule, which is um, capped and polyadenylated uh, and exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it gets translated into protein and the protein is folded and various post-translational modifications take place uh, and we wind up with this 3D structure at least for protein coding genes which is the functional unit uh, of the gene in most cases. So these are the things that we're often ultimately concerned about these uh, protein sequences. If we could sequence those and characterize quantify them in a massively parallel fashion with high accuracy, a lot of people would probably just do that. So you would just directly interrogate the protein since that's often what we care about. Uh, but that's generally not possible with uh, current technology, so proteomics has come a long way, but it's still quite expensive to do anything that's even sort of medium throughput is still quite expensive. Uh, so RNA-seq is often sort of a proxy uh, for, for doing that, where we're, we're hoping that by identifying differences in RNA expression patterns that those reveal something about what's happening at the protein level. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of stuff that specifically happens at the RNA level. So there's many uh, transcripts that are not actually protein coding that are nevertheless uh, very important and functional. Um, so the reason, the main reason I show this is just to kind of remind all of ourselves what is the thing that we're primarily interrogating in an RNA-seq experiment. Uh, and the goal of RNA-seq is really to characterize these mature mRNA molecules. But there's a, a, quite a few sort of nuances and gotchas related to that. Um, so one of them is that uh, in many species, most of the species that you all mentioned, the transcripts tend to be, you know, fairly long. Uh, so 1,000 to 10,000 bases might be sort of a typical range for a typical transcript sequence when you put all the exons together. Uh, and RNA-seq is not sequencing those things in full length. It's, they're not intact. What we're sequencing is usually cDNA, not RNA, first of all, and usually it's relatively small fragments. So these things are broken into small pieces that are in the range of 200 to 300 bases long. Uh, and those are the things that we're actually able to sequence, and we're often not even sequencing those entire fragments. We're just sequencing the ends of those uh, those fragments, um, and sometimes the reads, two reads might meet in the middle, or you may only have single-end reads, in which case you're just really sequencing a little piece of the fragment. Uh, so a lot of the analysis is inferring from those little pieces of information what the transcripts actually looked like and how abundant they were. But there's a lot of inference uh, built into this system. So we should always kind of keep that in mind and maintain a sort of healthy level of skepticism about predictions of the full length structure of RNAs that come out of this uh, and also uh, the degree to which this sort of relatively somewhat biased way of looking at the transcriptome may result in bias uh, in the, the output that we get at the end of an RNA-seq experiment. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. The cDNA is just uh, a reverse transcribed copy of the RNA, so it, it has the full RNA sequence, including the UTRs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so people talk about sequencing mature mRNA or polyadenylated RNA where you capture um, or otherwise enrich for polyadenylated transcripts, but really it's the, it's the whole transcript. It's usually not focused on the, just the, the coding portion of it. Um, although there are some techniques where people try to focus their data even more onto, onto those regions by, say, capturing the exons. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few slides. Anything else?
Okay, so here's just a really, again, kind of cartoon overview of what an RNA sequencing experiment actually looks like. Uh, so this is going to sort of mimic what we do to some degree in the um, hands-on exercise. So we're going to start with some, some samples of interest. Um, so say let's, let's say the sort of simplest scenario is we have condition one and condition two, uh, and it's a tumor normal comparison uh, in this example. Uh, we're going to isolate RNA from both of those samples. Uh, and so it, we're showing here sort of long uh, RNA sequences that are polyadenylated. Uh, and then we're going to generate cDNA off of uh, those RNAs, uh, fragment that, uh, and the fragmentation can, can, can occur at different stages, but somehow we usually we, we do some kind of fragmentation. They'll, then there'll be a size selection, and then we'll add linkers, uh, and then these things will get sequenced. So these are these small fragments that are made up of, of pieces of the RNA. Um, these things are going to get uh, put onto an Illumina flow cell usually. Is there anyone working with the platform other than Illumina data that came from... I don't know, Ryan Torrent or the Minion. Okay, yeah. So Oxford Nanopore is a is a is a company that produces single uh, or uh, nanopore sequencing instruments, um, and some people are starting to play around with sequencing RNA on them, and that's kind of a really interesting point to raise here. It relates to what I was just talking about that sort of the the appeal of PacBio or Oxford Nanopore sequencing is that you could sequence longer potentially full-length RNA sequences, and if you could do that in a high-throughput enough fashion, then a bunch of that inference of putting the jigsaw puzzle back together with these little pieces would go away. You could just feed each RNA through the pore and sequence it from one end to the other end, and you would see the complete structure of all the exons um, without having to kind of stitch them together, and then you could just count. How many times did I see this full-length molecule? How many times did I see that one? Uh, and you could get both your abundance and your structure information sort of in one shot, and it would really make the analysis, and, you know, sort of much simpler, more accurate, more powerful in terms of understanding alternative isoforms and so forth. Um, but the technology is still sort of in a fairly early stage of development. So people are doing it. Um, it's not as high throughput as Illumina. Um, the error rate is still high. Um, it can be sort of uh, there are still biases. Um, so to produce a sort of comparable uh, amount of information for an RNA sample on the Ox Oxford Nanopore I think still costs quite a lot because of the, the amount of time you have to run one of these sequencing instruments. Um, but they are working on it, so there's, they have new instruments that increase the throughput of the system, uh, so they're gradually reducing the cost. Um, but it seems to be a very gradual improvement. So I mean, I, I first read about nanopore sequencing in the early 90s in a Scientific American article in like 92 and they were talking about how it was like just around the corner that we were going to be sequencing full-length chromosomes and you know feeding all kinds of things to these pores and here we are 2018 and they're like well we're still working out the technical details and you can tr you can do it but it, there's a lot of challenges to getting great data and uh, in a cost-effective way. I'm not sure if they were in came out with it or not but they were supposed to also be the first technology that sequences RNA directly. Yes. That's another appeal, right? So, it, yeah. So you think about these steps here. Like, so this is a kind of you know high-level simplification where we have to generate cDNA and then fragment it and size select it and add linkers. Each of those steps has real bias built into it, right? So how do you sit, sit, generate the cDNA? You know, you have a, a an enzyme like a reverse transcriptase, and you have something that primes. You have random hexamers or a poly uh, A uh, or oligo -T DT primer. Um, that introduces bias because, you know, for various reasons, there isn't a good uh, place for the oligo uh, to bind, or those random hexamers aren't really random, or they don't sit down in a perfectly random way. Uh, the reverse transcriptase has sort of um, differential processivity for different types of sequences, so it introduces bias into the output by doing some things better than doing other things. Um, the fragmentation affects different molecules differently because they have different three-dimensional structures or different strengths or weaknesses in them. The size selection, you know, introduces a bias toward, towards things that kind of fit into the size. You may lose really small things or have uh, different biases for really long transcripts. Anytime you're adding linkers, it's an enzymatic process, so there's bias in terms of efficiency of, of where the linkers get added and where they don't get added. So the appeal of the the nanopore instrument is that if you could just take raw, sort of unadulterated RNA and just feed it through this instrument and get this readout, it would be this more pure 
uh, sort of uh, untouched. Yes, exactly. This is what the more like what the transcriptome really looks like. Um, so we're you know you should actively you know watch those technologies and, and think about when you should try them for your your particular um, experimental system. Yeah, so you're right that um, everything has its yeah everything has its pros and cons, uh, and so uh, I'm sure that nanopore sequencing will will be no exception, and it'll have its own sort of caveats and biases associated with it for sure. Yeah, I haven't worked with enough of the data yet to really have a great sense of what those are, but you're you're absolutely right. It's just we're we're kind of gradually you know moving closer towards this more idealized scenario, but achieving the true ideal is, is elusive. <laughs> yeah, for sure, to her point, uh, it's going to be those protein, or proteins are going to move some, or any molecules better than others through the pore. And it's... Some things don't fit through the pore as easily. Some things form secondary structures that are difficult to disrupt. Yeah, so... Some things are fragile. They break when they're going through the pore, maybe. There's, yeah, there's lots of still potential for... So if you really want the answer, you should sequence with all the technologies available. Yeah, so that's so that's an, a, a sort of approach or thought that will probably come up multiple times over the next three days. Is you know we're always so I'm trying to express this sort of like skepticism about each of these analytical approaches and each of the data generation approaches. And sort of one common strategy to that is to being skeptical to try orthogonal pr approaches and try to see you know where the agreement and disagreement is and what what uh, answers seem to be robust across orthogonal approaches is sort of, it's one sort of tool that you use to, to zero in on things that are um, platform independent and therefore perhaps less likely to be a, a bias or artifact of the platform. Yeah. So that, that's something that I picked up in the readings where they would say, if you do it this way, then you might get this bias. If you do it that way, like, especially when it comes to uh, identifying novel transcripts. And so like, I kept pinging in my head that, if, you know, I know cost is always an issue and time a bit as well, but I'm expecting that as we go, that there will be instances where it's feasible to actually do both, especially when you're when you have the data, like when you're just designing your experiment, you probably have to make a call about one thing or another. But in terms of the analysis, I imagine there are points where you can go in, in one direction and then try the other, and then yes. compare, and then say, okay, here's Absolutely. my pinch points where it's not jiving, and this is where it is, and it's, you yeah. know. It would just be interesting to get your point of view on that as we go through where you think really good places are to do that kind of that redundant type of analysis. Yeah, so we do this a lot and you know, all of our projects we're always kind of trying different things and comparing different approaches and there's a bunch of advantages to it. Um, one is sort of just a pragmatic, um, it's sort of a sanity check. So if you don't get it, if you get really bad agreement, sometimes that reveals errors or mistakes that you actually made in the in one of the analyses, and that helps you sort of track things down. And one of the exercises we'll do in the next couple of days is to try the, the sort of primary expression analysis, like the abundance estimation from raw RNA seq data. We're going to do it kind of three completely sort of somewhat orthogonal ways. We're going to do the sort of raw counts based approach that there's sort of like a whole camp of people that are, you know really into the statistics of quantifying RNA-seq and differential expression. They really like this idea of raw counts as the input. And then there's the, the camp of uh, tools that try to do some kind of baked-in normalization for transcript size and library depth, the sort of FPKM or TPM uh, kind of camp. Uh, and then there's the alignment-based approaches versus the alignment-free approaches like Callisto and Salmon and Sailfish. Uh, and so we're going to pick sort of three examples of uh, paths through those three different um, uh, expression abundance uh, approaches, and then we're going to compare the three to each other. Okay, so we're not actually going to do the RNA sequencing. We're we're going to start with raw data, but it, it's important to sort of keep in mind the sort of the the upstream details uh, of how your data was generated, of course, because sometimes that that can influence interpretation uh, of your results. So why would we sequence RNA? Probably none of you need to be talked into the, the value of sequencing RNA, but just to review some of the, the sort of main arguments for it. Um, uh, 
functional studies, of course. So this is sort of the functional biology. And so instead of sequencing the genome, which is constant, um, but an, where an experimental condition has a pronounced effect on gene expression, uh, so we can see that effect only by sequencing the transcriptome. It won't be apparent in the genome of the, uh, these two conditions. Uh, predicting transcript sequences from the genome sequence is difficult. So there's a whole field of bioinformatics that spent you know, a decade or more trying to predict what uh, genes and transcripts would look like based on sequencing the genome. So there used to be a lot of groups that sequenced the genome of a model organism or some critter, uh, some species, and they would just look at the genome sequence and try to identify features that looked like exons and features that looked like introns and think about how they would get stitched together into a transcript. And this is really difficult to do. And a huge amount of, uh, of really smart people uh, came up with some fairly decent ways uh, of doing that. Uh, but now we can just sequence the RNA, and then we can align those RNA sequences back against the genome. It's an extremely powerful approach to resolving uh, the structures of transcripts. And then actually the added bonus is that you get to see how abundant they are. Um, so gene, gene annotation has really been revolutionized by the advent of, of RNA-seq. Um, of course, some molecular features can only be observed at the RNA level. So things like alternative isoforms, really hard to tell from the genome what those things are going to be. Uh, fusion transcripts, again, uh, when there's a rearrangement in the genome, it's sometimes very difficult to know for sure what the, the RNA uh, fusion will look like. RNA editing events, of course, are only apparent in the RNA itself. Uh, some cancer-specific stuff, so interpreting mutations that don't have an obvious effect on the protein sequence. Regulatory mutation analysis, of course. Uh, and then something we use RNA-seq for quite a lot is prioritizing protein coding mutations uh, according to the, the expression of uh, uh, alleles that contain the, the mutation. So this is a common uh, application uh, in cancer. Uh, and then Obi mentioned uh, that we're doing quite a lot of work with personalized cancer vaccine design. RNA-seq is very important to that uh, as well because we really only care about uh, epitopes that are, are actually expressed and could be made into a protein when we're thinking about designing a, a vaccine for a patient. Some of the challenges that are particular to RNA-seq, so I'm sure you're, you're aware of many of these issues. Uh, purity, just like any sample, uh, this would be relevant for DNA or, or epigenetic studies as well, but the purity of the sample. So if you have a mixture of cells and you're interested in a subset of those cells, uh, so in tumor, the, tumor biology, the classic example is you have stroma mixed in with your tumor cells, and that's diluting the signal of, of your tumor cells when you do an RNA-seq experiment. If you have you know, too few tumor cells, it can be hard to understand the, the expression patterns because you're basically not sequencing the thing that you care about uh, entirely or, or mostly. Uh, quantity, of course, is a problem. If you can't get enough RNA, then you'll have problems uh, analyzing the, the transcriptome of those cells. Uh, quality is a problem with RNA much more than DNA, so RNA is sort of infamously uh, fragile. It degrades easily, uh, and that can be a real source of bias. Uh, across an experiment when you have differential RNA quality across your experiment. Um, of course, RNA consists of small exons that are separated by large introns, as shown in the, the previous uh, cartoons. This creates uh, a challenge for the mapping or alignment of reads back to the genome. So if you're sequencing DNA, you get to, for the most part, just align your reads directly against the reference genome, and you don't have to worry about these big gaps caused by uh, introns. Uh, in RNA-seq, the, the alignment is, is considerably more challenging because you have these gaps. And that put, places a greater emphasis on read length. So we're talking about pretty short reads here. In this sort of grand scheme of sequencing technologies, the NGS sequencing reads are really, really short. So they're shorter than even not that great EST sequencing that we did for you know decades before NGS sequencing came along. Uh, and if the reads are too short, it can be really hard to resolve those exon-exon structures. It can be hard to tell where the, the intron starts and where the next exon begins when you're aligning reads back against the reference genome. So you want to think about that when you're designing your experiment uh, and submitting your samples to the, to the core. Does anyone, what kind of read lengths are you guys dealing with? Is, is, who has reads that are, say, 50 or smaller? Does anyone have short reads, short, short reads like that? What about 75? Anyone? Okay. What about like 100 at least? What about like 150? Okay. So there's like, yeah, quite a mix. Um, and this is one of the choices you have to make when you're designing an RNA-seq experiment is do I have single end reads or do I have paired end reads? Uh, and how long should the reads be? And one of the, the real uh, 
uh, important factors in determining the length of the reads is how much do you care about accurately being able to resolve the exon intron structure of transcripts and how much do you want to be able to assemble full length transcript sequences um, versus just getting kind of really basic abundance output for sort of the transcriptional output from each gene locus. Uh, and depending where you fall on that scale, you might shift towards shorter reads that are cheaper, allowing you to do more samples, or longer reads that cost more and you can do maybe less samples or less experimental conditions. Okay, yeah, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're interested in knowing what transcript species are there, but you do have prior knowledge about what the transcript structures look like. So you have annotation has been done, possibly with some other longer read information being used in the past to give you a kind of a database of reference transcripts. So what's the, the, the read length that you care about there? Um, so it definitely, if you have a good reference transcriptome, so not the reference genome, but the reference transcriptome, um, that definitely helps a lot, and you can get away with shorter reads. I still think that probably 75 is about as low you, as you would want to go, um, but you probably will be, you know, able to do a pretty good job with 75 MERS. If you're more interested in the de novo transcript discovery, then I would say definitely go longer. Um, I mean, longer is better. 150 is kind of a, a common sweet spot right now for Illumina sequencing. There's a lot of production centers that are just making huge amounts of paired 150 based data. And so that's often kind of like it'll be a good price point. Um, and to go longer than that will start to get more expensive. Also, the quality does still start to tail off. The base quality of reads starts to tail off as you get out, out past 150 or 200 bases still. So there's it starts to be sort of diminishing returns when you get longer than that. Um, but obviously longer is, <laughs> the longer the better. If you can, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, another challenge that's particular to RNA is the, the relative abundance problem. So RNA's relative abundance vary widely. There are genes that are transcribed at a very low level. Uh, so just a few copies per cell. Uh, and that's the functionally important level of that gene. And there are other genes that are transcribed at a very, very high level, say tens of thousands of copies per cell, and that's how many they're needed for that RNA and protein to be functional in that cell. So you can imagine the difference between, say, a structural protein that's used to sort of build the fundamental structure of the cell. You, you need a lot of output of that thing, perhaps, especially when cells are dividing act actively. But uh, a signaling molecule that's involved in a signaling cascade, that could be a very sort of... Uh, nuanced kind of signal where just a few copies can trigger this this sort of signaling cascade. Uh, and so you can have um, genes that are, are just really rare, uh, but still really biologically important relative to, to other genes. So this creates a problem for sequencing because RNA sequencing works by shotgun sequencing. So we're not able to decide which transcripts we sequence. We're just effectively pulling uh, sequences out of a hat randomly. Uh, without much control over it. So we, if you just randomly pull reads, you tend to get the things that are very abundant and the things that are rare. You need a lot of data before you're able to sample those things uh, effectively. So this is really the thing that fundamentally influences or limits uh, your choices with regards to how much data you produce. So how much do you care about having sensitive detection of those transcripts that are present in the cell at relatively low copy number? Um, so if you need to be able to profile those things, then you're just going to need uh, whatever amount of data is needed to, to get down to those low level of expression. And this is quite different from DNA sequencing where, uh, you know, you have a bunch of chromosomes, but they're all uh, essentially present in whatever the normal ploidy status is for your system. So in human, they're all there in a diploid state. So you can uh, expect approximately even random sampling across the whole reference genome. Uh, and you don't have to worry about differential abundance of chromosome 21 versus chromosome 3, uh, for example. And then similarly, RNAs come in a wide range of sizes. Uh, again, there are really small RNAs that are functional and important and very critical uh, to, to whatever biology you're uh, interested in. And then there are other transcripts that could be 100 KB or, or even longer. Uh, and that creates a bit of a, a problem in that we... 
are trying to design one experimental uh, library construction strategy that uh, captures the information from all of those things and that's really difficult to do so it's it's generally accepted that your your view of the transcriptome in an RNA-seq experiment is somewhat biased towards a certain uh, size of transcripts usually the way people uh, sort of divide and conquer is they go after everything that's say bigger than a hundred bases uh, and up that's sort of considered classical RNA-seq <coughs> and then if you're interested in small RNAs you basically need a different experimental uh, procedures so you design a separate library and sequencing approach for the really small RNAs. Uh, and there are some people that divide it into small, intermediate, and large, uh, and there's sort of various schemes. Um, but generally, most RNA-seq uh, data sets are quite biased uh, towards transcripts above a certain size, and they're generally not good for small RNA species. Uh, so you'll get sort of more biased output from those uh, things. Uh, and just in terms of designing the, the length of your sequencing reads, if you're going after microRNAs, for example, it doesn't really make sense to do a 2 by 150 base sequencing strategy when the things that you're interested in sequencing are very, very small compared to those read lengths. Um, so you'll often see, you know, depending on your interests, some variation in the, the way the libraries are constructed there. And this, again, is particular to RNA. You don't have this problem in DNA. The chromosomes are all massive compared to what we're sequencing in RNA-seq. So for all intents and purposes, the size is kind of irrelevant uh, in, a, in a genome sequencing experiment. All of the chromosomes are massive compared to the fragments you're sequencing, and they're all there in approximately equal copy number. So you just kind of break all the pieces up, and you get the sort of even representation of the, the whole genome uh, with sort of a different set of caveats. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, RNA is quite fragile compared to DNA, so that's something you really have to watch out for. Um, who's familiar with this, the Agilent uh, QC assays? Have you guys? So this will be really common before you send your samples to wherever your sequencing is done. You'll often run one of these lab-on-a-chip uh, assays uh, with this really commonly used Agilent uh, instrument that effectively you're running your RNA on a gel, uh, except instead of running on a gel, you're feeding it through a capillary electrophoresis. Uh, where as RNA passes past a detector in the, this capillary, you get a kind of readout of abundance. The small stuff moves the most quickly through the gel, and the larger stuff takes more time to move. And so the small stuff comes out uh, the fastest. And then over time, you get this, this readout that's often called an electrophorogram uh, that sort of gives you these spikes that correspond to the, the sizes of RNAs and how abundant they were. And I'm just showing uh, two examples here. Uh, one, uh, this is some RNA that I isolated from a cell line that was sort of happily growing one minute, and the next minute the cells were being uh, broken open and the RNA isolated, and so there was very little degradation. Uh, and what you see in human is sort of two big spikes for the, the main ribosomal RNA species, and then a little hump down here that you can barely see. That's sort of where all the mRNA is. Uh, so this sample is, you know, 98 or 99 percent ribosomal RNA, which is typical. Uh, for uh, human cells. Uh, and then if the RNA is really degraded, basically what we see is that all of these ribosomal RNAs are, are being broken into pieces, and so we start to see these spikes uh, corresponding to smaller and smaller RNA species. On a gel, this would look like a smear, and I'll show a few examples of that. Um, a lot of uh, sequencing cores will have some kind of cutoff that's based on this score, so the RIN score, RNA integrity number, is a sort of quantitative estimate of how much degradation is present by analyzing the, the sort of intactness uh, of these two peaks. Uh, and so you get a perfect 10 score when it looks like this, and then as things get more degraded, the score goes down all the way as low as, you know, zero in theory. Um, and a lot of cores will have like a RIN score of 8 or 7.5 is sort of a typical cutoff where they say uh, if the RNA is more degraded than that, then they'll probably still sequence it, but they kind of will waive their uh, whatever their warranty or, you know, they'll basically say if the data is no good, then that's on you. Um, but in the end of the day, you're interested in mRNA, right? Yeah, but the mRNA is also presumably right. being degraded in a similar way. So the ribosomal RNA is like a, you're using it as a kind of canary for de just degradation that's happened in the sample. Yeah. Uh, and so this link that I have here is just a, a, a PDF of a whole bunch of examples of these electrophorograms from different types of RNA isolation from FFPE, from actively growing cells. So you can kind of see the full spectrum from like really beautiful intact RNA to really heavily degraded. Yes, question at the back. Um, maybe it's a 
Yeah, so I, I include a bunch of examples in that, this PDF that I linked there, where I think these were um, colon cancer specimens that were from FFP blocks that ranged in age from quite recent to many, many years old, been sitting in a drawer somewhere for five years. And so you can see that the level of degradation goes all the way um, down to, you know, RIN scores that are in the kind of two range. Um, and basically what it looks like is these these spikes keep moving this way and this way this way until eventually you just see a hump that's like kind of right here um, where everything is sort of fragmented down to at most 150 to 200 bases or shorter. Um, and that, that's typical for an FFP sample that's really like the worst case scenario, like it's, it's been sitting in a shelf, it wasn't a frozen block, it wasn't done recently. There are people that do kind of FFP and then they cut scrolls off like right away and do an RNA-seq from that and then you'll see much better. You might see four, five, six, even seven RIN score for that scenario. And then the older and more fixed it is, it goes all the way down to, to 1.5 to 2. We have done sequencing all the way down to completely degraded, and what we typically do in those scenarios is skip the fragmentation step. So basically, degradation is fragmented for you. Uh, fragmentation no longer required. Um, and what we'll usually do is a cDNA capture of those samples. Um, and we don't usually do it for differential expression analysis. I think that is quite challenging. You might need a lot of replicates. Um, and low biological variability to still get a useful experiment out of RNA that's that heavily degraded. But for other applications, it can still be useful. So you can still detect whether mutations are present and expressed. So we'll do this in the, in the vaccine uh, design scenario. For example, if we, if we have a patient where we just simply don't have all we have is a block, um, we'll do it. And we, we still do this, the RNA sequencing, and we do a cDNA capture. And it, that is pretty effective at sort of recover, recovering the quality of heavily degraded FFP samples. Yeah. Yes? Um, you can't have your samples have enough patients that they need for sequencing? That's a good question. And it's ideally, yes. <laughs> ideally, you don't want a wide range of levels of degradation across the samples that you intend to compare to each other. Particularly, you don't want some kind of bias between condition A and condition B that you hope to compare. So it's something that you would definitely want to think about all the way through to the end of your experiment and interpretation. So you, at the end of the day, you wind up with, say, a heat map with condition A versus condition B plot the, the RIN values on, onto that and try to and watch out for batch effects that may be relevant to the level of degradation and not to the biology you're interested in. And if you see or suspect that this is a problem, you're probably going to want to spend more time thinking about careful normalization um, of the samples before you do your comparison and then just always thinking, is what I'm seeing here potentially caused by the differential RNA quality between my two comparison groups versus the biology? Why is it, why would it be differential? Yeah, why does the degradation affect your sequencing result? Um, I guess it, it influences some of the biases that are already in the system. So you're applying the same size selection strategy to these things, the same fragmentation approach, but you're starting with kind of different starting points. So one thing is already effectively partially degraded, um, and so you're basically increasing the chance that something's going to, like in one sample, things will get degraded to such a small level that they'll actually be lost completely, and then the abundance of those things will appear to be less. But it wasn't because they're actually less abundant. It's because they were kind of pre-fragmented, and then you applied the same fragmentation protocol to both of your conditions. So that's sort of like one simple way that you could imagine it, but there are probably others as well. Yeah, so I don't. I think that people tend to think about degradation as a somewhat random process, but only out of convenience. <laughs> um, but I, 
I, I imagine it's quite non-random. So, so a lot of degradation is enzymatically driven. So you have uh, RNases that are actively degrading RNA, and of course they have, you know, they operate with certain sequence contexts. So they degrade certain spots more than they degrade others. Um, and then even more sort of mechanical degradation processes, of course, are also non-random because they'll be influenced, influenced by GC content, um, by uh, secondary structures, the RNA forms, and so forth. So it's definitely not random. But it's something that people just kind of gloss over. <laughs> so that's another reason why you need to worry about um, the difference in degradation level between your comparison groups. Okay, so related to this discussion we've been having about sort of experimental design considerations, um, there's been a few uh, standards, guidelines, and best practices for RNA-seq that have been published uh, over the years, and I'm linking to uh, a few of them here. These are a little bit out of date, um, but really RNA-seq fu fundamentally hasn't changed that much in the last five or six years, so, and these are pretty fundamental experimental design considerations, so they're still very relevant there. So these documents talk about things like how many replicates should you include, um, how should you do your size selection, how much uh, input material should you use, how consistent should that be, should you use uh, spike in control sequences in your library construction procedure and so forth. Um, and they're, you know, they're quite idealized. Uh, you probably, uh, if you have an experiment already and you go and look at these guidelines, you probably didn't, don't have an experiment that followed all of these guidelines, but they're definitely things to aspire to. Um, um, so we've talked a little bit about this. These are sort of other uh, design considerations that you should keep in mind. Uh, so there are a bunch of sort of forks in the road in terms of how your RNA-seq uh, data was created. A lot of people doing analysis of RNA-seq data start with uh, someone basically handing it to them. So the experiment has already happened. Design considerations have already been taken into account and sort of out of your control, right? So you're, you weren't there from square one. Uh, or you're being asked to combine data sets from, you know, these three papers or from a collaborating lab with our, with our lab or whatever. Uh, and so all of these things are things you should really take into account to, to try to get a sense of how comparable are these data sets to each other and how much do I need to worry about batch effects uh, and possibly correcting for batch effects or, or doing some kind of additional normalization. Uh, so common things that differ are some people do total RNA uh, versus poly A selection. Uh, so poly A selection is where you actively try to enrich for polyadenylated species to enrich for mRNAs. Uh, if you do a total RNA-based method, then you're probably kind of taking the other approach where you try to rem remove the ribosomal RNA species. Otherwise, you would just sequence those ribosomal RNAs over and over again without ever getting to the rest of the genes in the genome. Um, size selection, uh, so there may be different size ranges that were selected. Uh, some labs like to go after a narrow fragment size distribution. Uh, other labs go for a fairly broad uh, fragment size distribution. Uh, linear amplification used to be a common strategy for small amounts of RNA where you would uh, basically try to increase the, the amount of RNA by amplifying it uh, with a, a linear approach. Uh, standard versus unstranded libraries, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Most libraries now are being created in a strand uh, way where you know this, the strand of transcription that was used, uh, but there's a lot of RNA-seq data out there still where basically you're sequencing double-stranded RNA, so you can try to, in you can infer pr fairly accurately what strand likely was uh, expressed um, or transcribed, but you're sequencing both, so you don't actually know for sure. Uh, exome captured versus uncaptured, so I mentioned this idea that uh, you can uh, take your RNA library uh, and hybridize it to some set of probes that correspond, for example, to the known exons of your species to enrich for um, RNAs that are actually corresponding to known transcripts and genes uh, in a sort of a way to clean up data from problematic samples or to make your sequencing more efficient. Uh, library normalization, so this is where there's some kind of step upstream where you try to deal with this problem that some genes are really, really highly expressed and some genes are really lowly expressed. There are various approaches to kind of compress that range a little bit so that you can sequence more lowly expressed species and spend less time sequencing the really highly expressed species. And all of these details uh, could in theory affect your analysis strategy and especially the, the comparisons between libraries. So just to make a few of these things um, a bit more visual, um, what I'm showing here is, is an example uh, of a few different uh, sort of hypothetical um, 
RNA samples that, uh, in this case, instead of sort of doing the Agilent electrophorogram analysis, they've been run on a hypothetical gel, and this is totally contrived, where we have, you know, really intact total RNA here, partially degraded RNA that's starting to become a bit of a smear, heavily degraded RNA. Uh, and then after we've isolated the mRNA, uh, this is kind of what your gel will look like, where we've gotten rid of a lot of the ribosome RNA. So usually what happens in an RNA-seq experiment is you start by, with some tissue or cells, you isolate RNA, and you do this kind of uh, RNA quality assessment. Uh, and then often there'll be a, a DNA's treatment uh, where you uh, try to get rid of any DNA molecules that are in your RNA. Uh, and then you can do an RNA fragmentation, uh, or sometimes that happens after cDNA, cDNA synthesis. Uh, but then you do a cDNA synthesis with uh, either an oligo-DT or a random hexamer approach usually. Um, and then the fragmentation uh, and size selection. Uh, and at each of these steps, you could run uh, this Agilent assay to get a sense of, uh, in this case, the, the quality of the raw RNA prior to any manipulation. Uh, and then in each of the subsequent steps, sort of the status of, of your library. And ultimately, you wind up with this sort of selected RNA molecules of a certain size. Uh, most of the small RNAs uh, would be lost in this particular uh, example. Uh, and then you add your sequencing adapters, uh, and those are the things that you're going to prime the actual sequence generation off of uh, when you run them uh, on the sequencing uh, instrument. So I just had a quick question. So if you're, if you're doing the total RNA, are you still capturing some of the poly A so RNA? Yeah, so you're, you're not, not, you're not, you're not yeah, you're not it's excluding them. It's yeah. just the opposite. You're yes. only getting the poly A. Yes, and that is covered on the next slide. Are there any? Are there any other questions about this before I move to that? Okay. Yeah, so there's these different ways of enriching. Um, and all of them are kind of <laughs> still in use. So we haven't really, uh, because it depends a little bit on what your goals are. Um, but if you think about just sort of the, the, the basic uh, RNA where it has no manipulation, you have total RNA, where basically, and if you think about how the, the reads will align against the reference genome, most of them are going to align to ribosomal RNA regions because that's what most of the RNA in the cell is made up of. So, and it's just really impractical to sequence RNA in, in this totally unadulterated fashion. So you have to basically have to do something to get rid of some amount of the ribosomal RNA, hopefully most of it. Um, and there are sort of three general approaches. Uh, the first is uh, rRNA uh, reduction. Uh, so this is basically you have uh, in a tube a bunch of oligonucleotides that correspond in sequence to the, the RNA, ribosomal RNA uh, transcripts for your species. So you'll have a reagent like this for each, designed for each species. And you basically, uh, those uh, probes are attached to beads. You mix your RNA or your cDNA with that, those beads, and they grab onto all the ribosomal RNA sequences. Um, and then you basically elute everything that doesn't stick and it's heavily enriched for everything that isn't RNA, ribosomal RNA, including polyadenylated. But I think one of the, the sort of selling points of this approach is it gives you a, a more unbiased view of the transcriptome. So you're basically grabbing onto the ribosomal RNAs, but you're letting everything else come through, which includes both polyadenylated and not polyadenylated species. So you have potential for you know, coding and non-coding genes. Um, there's more sort of potential to discover you know, link RNAs and uh, other kind of not, not polyadenylated RNAs that may still be functionally important. Um, but another common approach is to do, uh, at the bottom here, uh, poly A selection. So that's sort of the reverse. You have a similar uh, situation where you have uh, oligos attached to beads, but in this case the oligos are just oligo DT, and you grab onto all of the poly A tails of all of your species, and then you wash everything else away, including the ribosomal RNAs, but also all of the other non-polyadenylated RNAs that could be important. Uh, and one of the sort of gotchas of that approach is that while you're holding on to the three prime tail of all of your, your coding transcripts, if there's any degradation that has happened, you're basically going to bias yourself towards the three prime end of your transcript because you're holding on to the three prime end. If that RNA is broken, the five prime end can be washed away uh, and it won't make it into your final sample. So this is a sort of a common uh, QC step when you're dealing with poly A uh, RNA seq data is to try to assess to what degree am I losing the five prime end of, of transcripts. And the longer the transcripts are, the more chance there is that you've broken off the five prime end and that has been lost. Uh, and you'll, you'll tend to see that play out uh, pretty clearly in RNA that's got anything more than just a little bit of, of degradation. 
And then the final approach um, is to just directly hybridize again with these oligos on beads to some notion of the known transcriptome. So you know what the exons are and you design oligos for all of the say human exons across the entire uh, genome uh, and you hybridize your cDNA library against that. Uh, any, anything that doesn't correspond to a known exon gets washed away and you don't select the rib, you don't try to target the ribosomal RNA so those get washed away. Um, and so the, the caveat of that is um, that it relies on prior knowledge of the transcriptomes. You need to know what those exon sequences are um, and you're sort of biasing yourself towards that. It also, you're kind of introducing a little bit of a bias in terms of the expression abundance estimation and that you're kind of uh, selecting for all of these things. So it, it does uh, have a little bit of a normalization effect where it compresses the, the range of expression values that come out. So lowly expressed things tend to get pulled up a bit and highly expressed things uh, tend to get pushed down a bit. So that can be kind of an advantage or disadvantage depending on how you think about it. Yeah? Yes, many thousands, hundreds of thousands. Um, so there, but there are a number of companies that have come up with very efficient ways of synthesizing oligonucleotides, and then they basically just do this once every few years. They they come up with a design, um, and then they just they make it available off the shelf as a product you can buy, and they do it in such an efficient way that it's only a few hundred dollars to buy that reagent for each sample. Um, and yes, so it, it, yeah, there's sort of two big caveats. One is if you're studying, you know, whatever random uh, not human mouse and a few other species, then they probably don't have one for you. So you might have to design it yourself. And some people do that, and that is very expensive. Um, so to, to, to be the first person to do it is quite expensive. If your species has enough sort of, of a market interest, Sometimes you can partner with those companies and in exchange for your expertise and knowledge about what, how, what it should look like, what the design should be, they will, um, you can basically come to an arrangement with them where they will put it in their catalog uh, and they'll give you some free reagents in exchange for you kind of doing the design for them. Um, so we've done that a few times on, on different scenarios. And there are, you know, we do it sometimes uh, for custom regions of the genome in human that aren't uh, sort of a, uh, that aren't in exon regions where an exon wouldn't make sense. Um, and it, you know, it, it's expensive, but it, it's feasible. Um, And there are a bunch of different companies that specialize in this, and they have kind of each have their pros and cons. So there are companies like IDT and Agilent um, and NimbleGen um, that are commonly used for this, and they've come up with different ways of efficiently synthesizing these massive numbers of, of unique probe sequences uh, to whatever specification you, spe you, you provide them. Yeah. Yes? Um, yes, yeah, so the question is when would you do cDNA capture instead of poly A? Um, so one way to think about it is with cDNA capture you could decide to enrich for known transcripts that whether they're polyadenylated or not. So if you have a mixture of genes you're interested in that aren't all polyadenylated then that, that would be one scenario. It also has the effect of, uh, it really does enrich your data for the regions you know about and care about. Uh, even more than poly A selection, with the sort of caveat that you're you have this bias that it's based on on prior knowledge, um, for uh, particularly for the heavily degraded samples that I mentioned, the poly A selection is doesn't work well at all because everything is broken, so you're just going to really introduce a huge three prime end bias. Whereas the advantage of the the cDNA capture is you're just directly capturing each of the regions, so it doesn't matter if that RNA was broken. Um, and you can no longer grab it by its three prime tail. You're just grabbing each piece independently. Um, so those are some of the common like ways people think about it. Any other questions? All right. Uh, and then the last cartoon here is this idea of stranded versus unstranded. So just to make this a little bit more visual, um, if you have unstranded data, uh, when you go to align it against a reference genome, 
uh, it'll look something like this. So we'll have reads that align uh, uh, and they line up with, with exons. And then in the genome viewers are encoded in the, the alignment file will be information about what strand the actual sequence you produced aligned against. And then you can uh, put them into two bins or you can color them in a visualizer according to their, their, their strand. Uh, and so, for example, in IGV, you can color them uh, red and blue for the positive and for the negative strand. And in sort of uh, classic RNA-seq unstranded, you'll see this sort of even mixture of uh, each of the reads came from either the positive strand or the negative strand, and it doesn't matter whether the gene was actually transcribed from the positive strand or the negative strand. So in this contrived example, I'm showing two genes, uh, one that's being transcribed on the top strand and one that's being transcribed from the bottom strand, and it, you don't really see that in the RNA-seq data, but you can still infer because from where these reads align and from especially the ones that span across splice sites, you can still infer with pretty good accuracy uh, what read that that um, the, the fragment actually was transcribed from, even though you don't know it. Uh, but now there's a bunch of methods where they're able to basically encode this information right into the data so you know what transcription strand was used. And then when you do this same visualization in IGV, now you see that they all sort of line up uh, in the way that you expect. And here's an example of some real data. Uh, I believe some of the data that we're going to look at uh, where we have two genes here that are arranged uh, in a I guess, tail-to-tail uh, -tail fashion. So they're both kind of ending in the middle here. Uh, and we can see that the reads, for the most part, uh, the coloring lines up uh, with the, the positive strand uh, and the negative strand. Uh, but if you look closely, you can see there is the sort of the odd exception where the strand information uh, either somehow was wrong or there actually was a very low level of transcription from uh, the opposite <coughs> strand. And of course, this information is really useful for people that are studying regions of the genome where genes legitimately do overlap on opposite strands or where you're looking at sense-antisense regulation. Uh, you really need to have this information to get a sense of, you know, which strand did my two reads come from. And you could imagine that there are some genes in the genome where um, you have uh, an RNA being transcribed from within an intron or that even spans across the exon of a gene on, on one transcript. And then there's another transcript with several exons on the, on the other strand. If you're not able to sort of separate those two, then the one can influence the expression abundance estimate of the other. Uh, and that can sometimes create weird uh, patterns or make it hard for you to interpret what's going on. So basically the unstranded ones. Do you know what the unstranded uh, version actually overestimates your expression level? It, so it could result in, yes, it could result in inflated abundance estimates for those genes for which there is antisense transcription that overlaps the exons of the gene that you're trying to, to estimate. And for those genes that you don't have, you should get pretty much the same with the stranded and the unstranded expression level. Right, yeah, so if you don't have that situation, then you should get a fairly consistent readout. Um, yeah. I was just going to ask, how, what is the quick and dirty explanation for how you Oh, yeah. This is like some really uh, in the weeds molecular biology. There are some like pretty nice diagrams of it. Some of the companies that do this, they have different um, approaches and they're a little bit dodgy about explaining exactly how they do it because that's like their secret sauce. Um, but most of them involve um, DUTP incorporation and then some kind of enzymatic degradation that sort of selectively degrades one strand. Um, I'm doing a horrible job of explaining this. I actually have, um, but there's some great figures, yeah. It really well how it goes to the yeah, so, yeah, let's share that. Um, it's, been a while, it's been a while since I looked it up. I've, I've had this question many times, and I go look it up, I'm like, okay, that makes sense, and then an hour later, I forget the details. Yeah, no, I, I really that. <laughs> Diagrams are good. Yeah. Is it possible to share things to our Google Classroom? Can we, can we share yeah. things mutually with each other that way? Is that what this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can go to that this classroom. How does this this code actually work? Did you explain that? Fantastic. Okay, now the last section here is just to go through sort of common uh, questions um, 
replicates is something that comes up a lot. Uh, during the early days of Illumina sequencing, people would do technical replicates. No one does that anymore. You, so just to cut to the chase, if you have data from two lanes on the same instrument or from you know, one flow cell and then the next day they ran you know, additional data for that sample on another flow cell or some of your conditions were spread across two flow cells, the platform has become so consistent at the technical level that as long as it passes the QC specs of your core, it's probably fine to compare across uh, that those sort of differences in data generation um, without really worrying about batch effects from one flow cell to the next um, for the most part. And so what's being shown here is just an example of sort of sequential flow cells with the same sample and the correlation uh, and expression estimates that come out and it's incredibly good. Uh, biological replicates of course are a completely uh, different story. So you still need biological and experimental replicates um, to the degree that the biology you're studying requires. And our, so RNA-seq is not magic. Um, RNA expression has a lot of variability, uh, and so you, you may need a substantial amount of biological replicates uh, to identify patterns. Um, there's really not much we can do about that. Um, common analysis goals. Uh, so what can we ask of the data? So we're going to go through some of these uh, between uh, the next few, uh, two days, and then Brian's going to cover additional ones on, on the third day. Uh, we're going to focus the most on gene expression and differential expression because that's probably just the most common uh, use case uh, and a lot of the analysis principles will apply to, to other more specific types of analysis like alternative expression analysis which actually Brian's going to cover that a fair amount so we have kind of two versions of, of, of the alternative expression analysis built into the work, uh, workshop. Uh, transcript discovery and annotation I mentioned already, uh, allele specific expression, so if you want to look for, say, for example, regulatory variants, you might be able to see a signature of those using uh, ASE. Mutation discovery, some people directly call mutations from uh, RNA-seq data. Uh, fusion detection is a common cancer specific application, RNA editing, uh, and of course there are, there are more as well. Um, all of the, these analysis goals have very similar sort of themes to their RNA-seq workflow. So each of them has a sort of pattern that's like start with your raw data, align or assemble your reads, uh, process the alignments with a tool that's specific to each of those goals. So you'll tend to see that there's sort of a fusion caller that takes alignments as input. There's an expression estimator that takes alignments as input. There's a mutation caller that takes alignments as input. So you have this sort of fork in the road where you start with a BAM file and then you do analysis XYZ with different tools. Um, and then there's usually some kind of post-processing. So almost every tool that uh, that's out there produces some kind of usually weird, hard to understand, crazy output file that's not very standardized. So there, the upstream steps, the data generation, your data will probably always come in a fast queue format. The alignments will generally always be sport, stored in a BAM format. Once you get past that, it's a complete wild west. There's very little uh, file format uh, standardization. So every tool does something different and crazy and mostly undocumented. Uh, so there's almost always some kind of post-process step where you create some kind of custom analysis to visualize, interpret, clean, filter, et cetera, your data. And so we're going to spend a fair amount of time on, on those kinds of concepts. Uh, and then, of course, summarizing and visualizing and creating the figures uh, that you use to communicate information to others in publications and presentations and so forth. Um, so pretty much always doing some version of that, uh, those steps. Uh, and mentioned BioStars. Um, if you haven't signed up for an account, I would in encourage you to do so and just kind of poke around. There's like an RNA-seq tab that sort of does a sort of pre-filter of questions and answers related to RNA-seq and there's an incredible wealth of, of interesting discussions in there about uh, RNA sequencing. Um, some common questions. Uh, so should I remove duplicates for RNA-seq? Sometimes people ask this if they're familiar with DNA sequencing. Uh, the short answer is is no, you shouldn't remove duplicates for, for RNA-seq or you can mark them generally and uh, downstream tools will just ignore the marking. Uh, and the reason you don't want to remove du duplicates in, in RNA-seq, so is everyone familiar with this, this concept of, of marking duplicates? The basic idea is you have uh, generated data and in DNA sequencing if you have uh, two reads that, that look like they correspond to exactly the same fragment, so it starts and ends at the same place, um, in DNA sequencing, we generally assume that that's likely a PCR amplification artifact, so it wasn't actually two unique observations of the same fragment. 
It was a PCR amplification where you just sequenced two copies of the same unique fragment. Uh, and so we generally mark all of those situations and just pick one as a reference so that we're not double counting uh, the, a fragment that isn't a unique DNA fragment, but rather it was just a copy of the same DNA fragment. Um, and you could imagine applying the same reasoning to RNA, but the, it's, it's problematic in RNA because of some of the features of RNA that we've already discussed, which is to say um, RNAs can be quite short and their abundances vary quite widely. So you could have uh, a situation where a relatively short transcript is really, really highly expressed. Uh, and now you actually expect to see the same fragments exactly uh, multiple times just because you don't have that many places to sample in that, that, uh, that transcript. You could generate the same fragment over and over again just because there's not that many ways to make fragments from that short sequence. So if you mark duplicates and just chose one of those, it would really mess up your abundance estimates. You'd basically be underestimating the abundance of short uh, transcripts. So it's generally a, a best practice to not mark duplicates uh, in RNA-seq data, except in certain uh, use cases. For example, some people still do it for mutation calling. Uh, yeah? Yeah, I would be fairly worried. Um, <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so the you know the one of the main interpretations of a really high duplication rate is that your library has low complexity, um, and usually that's caused by low inputs. So you didn't have enough material, and so there just wasn't enough unique molecules in there. And the way you know these library construction workflows work, they kind of um, you basically, the, the less material you have, you kind of just wind up with more amplification, and then you wind up with a certain amount of material that's needed to be lo loaded onto the flow cell. So they'll kind of work it out so that they can always put the same amount of molecules onto the flow cell. But if there was a small amount of input molecules, then the relative proportion of them that are just PCR duplicates of each other starts to go up and up until you know it's quite bad. Um, so that's sort of one reason why you would see a high duplication rate. Um, another potential reason is that um, you may have really low complexity in a different sense that, so for example, if your ribosomal RNA reduction step didn't work well, you could have a really high proportion of ribosomal RNA still in your sample. And then the reason you're seeing a lot of duplicates is because you're basically just sequencing the same few highly abundant transcripts over and over and over again. Uh, but both of those are pretty problematic for downstream analysis. Like, you're not going to get a robust view of the transcriptome. And if you have a big difference between some of your samples, it's going to be hard to uh, compare them and see differential gene expression values, for example. So it's definitely something you would want to keep in mind throughout the analysis interpretation and to see, like, are these samples really be, like outliers in a way that they need to be excluded or that you need to redo that those samples or whatever you can do. Um, I mean, I would say in that situation, the, th the thing you can do is try, if it's at least f as consistent as possible from sample to sample, that helps. And this is a situation where you may want to increase, perhaps substantially increase the number of replicates to compensate. Okay. Okay. And then you can see what is really Yeah. So in the low complexity scenario where you have small numbers of cells, and sometimes your biology is just, yeah. that it is what it is, right? Um, but so the way to do that is effectively to, to sequence more cells, but because you can't get more cells from a single mouse or from whatever mm -hmm. procedure, 
then you just you get more cells by increasing the number of experiments, the number of experimental replicates, and then you can ag an aggregate. The information can still be hopefully, you know, will resolve out of that if you have enough replicates. Yeah, that's a good. So the yeah. The question is, do more replicates or do pooling? Uh, people have really strong opinions about this. Statisticians. I'm not a statistician. Um, I think that uh, there are some good papers, and I think we referenced to some of those in the supplementary materials. Uh, I, I can't remember like the, the details of the arguments for one versus the other. You see a lot of people doing different things, so, and some people do a combination. So they'll do each sample will be a pool of nine you know, runs of isolating these cells, and then they'll do that whole thing like three times or five times. And yeah, yeah, there's a lot of variability. But you definitely see that strategy a lot, the pool strategy. Sometimes you're pooling just to, sometimes you have to pool just to get enough material to do the molecular biology. Like a lot of these molecular biology steps just simply don't work when the molarity is below some threshold. Like you need enough material to pellet something at some point. And there's just nothing you can do other than, yeah, pooling samples to the point that you get enough that it, it becomes feasible, and that's kind of that's an important consideration because if that step is is not robust to failure, then you have a like a lot of introducing you're introducing a lot of technical variability because sometimes the molecular biology is just like failing miserably. So I think you want to pool to the point where you can make a library robustly and consistently and then do that whole thing enough times to get your biological replicates to see the, you know, to get statistical power to see the, the patterns that you're going after. Other question? I just wanted to ask if you can use this duplicate information to find out the five prime PTRs, because obviously the pooling means should always start in the same location biasly at the five prime PTR, depending on how much you develop software for that. Hmm. Yeah, that's so you know interesting. I mean, the first yeah. Of the reach should always be yeah. So they usually use both the beginning and the end to decide whether something's a duplicate. Um, but yeah, you yeah you probably can use like. I mean, again, in RNA you wouldn't remove them, so they'll be there. Um, but you could go and look for them, and there I'm sure there are. I can't think of an example, but I'm sure there are tools that specialize in transcription start site identification that take into account that kind of information. Although, you know, transcription start sites do tend to, the polymerase picks up like in a window, but yeah. Yeah. Do you use ERCC spike in routinely or only at sort of the beginning of developing a workflow? Hmm, hard to answer in a idealized way. <laughs> um, they're a great idea and a really useful tool. Um, and I think you're kind of hitting on the point that a lot of people come to, which is it's, you know, it's an extra step and it's an extra cost. So a lot of people do it at the beginning of working up the technology and then they drop them. And that's pretty much what we do. Even though we teach this course and we tell, oh, use best standards. Uh, and the data you're going to use has the spike-ins. And we're going to show you how to analyze them and interpret them and use them to gain confidence that your data is good. But then in our own practice, being truthful, we don't use them routinely. Um, and that's kind of a decision, you know, I would probably argue that we should, but our, you know, core is sort of like, well, it increases cost and they want to charge us a lot for that. And they, they like things to be simple. And so you wind up with this, as you commonly do, less ideal approach being taken. Um, but definitely when you're, yeah, when you're starting with a new isolation protocol or some kind of major, like at the upfront biology is uncertain, it's a great way of, you know, telling, you know, how much variability is in my process and where is it coming from? Is it from the way I'm making my libraries? Is it from the, uh, the RNA isolation? Is it in the analysis and so forth? Yeah. So is there a formal protocol for working in the spike ends? Is, is there? Yeah. I mean, it comes with the, the, you know, pretty detailed guidelines come with the, the spike and reagents themselves. Um, and there's just, there's a prescribed way to do it. You just, yeah, you put a certain amount into each sample and the, as early as possible in the process, like basically as soon as you isolate RNA, I think you put it like pretty near the beginning so that those things go through the whole, it's not like you're spiking in a library at the end. Okay. You're spiking in material from which library will be created 
just like it's being created from your sample that you care about. So you can get a sense of, you know, did something fail? You know, if, if you don't get a good readout on your spikins, then something has gone wrong. So, I mean, at, at my university, we often send stuff to the NRC facility. Probably, I guess, it would work to liaise with them and figure out if they are used to handling that sort of stuff. They will probably, you know, a lot of cores will have it as an option on their kind of their menu, you know, with for an added cost, we'll include the spike in. And if they don't, it's probably possible that you could just do it on your end. Okay, basically, so in some ways, that's desirable, right? Because it's a control on them, you know? It's yeah. basically you're putting in positive controls into your experiment before you even send the sample to the core. Now you have like an experiment baked in that you can do for fundamental, like if you don't get back a reasonable range of abundances that fit the expected, you know, uh, linear relationship for those spike ins, and if you don't get the differential value between your two conditions, then you know something's gone wrong. Okay. Yeah. And then, sorry, in the resources, is there a recommended supplier of spike ins, or is it just at everyone's discretion? Um, I don't know, like, how many options there are. I know that the one that we use and that we provide the documentation for um, is quite popular. Uh, it's widely used. Um, so that one will be just, the ERCC yeah, one will be just fine for most purposes. But there, I'm sure there are competing options that are probably also just fine. Mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing wrong with the, the one that we recommend. That's the one that we use when we do use them. Okay, thank so. you. <coughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a really big question. Um, so the, basically the question is, if I understand correctly, um, are you, by doing the ribosomal RNA reduction, are you actually kind of throwing away potentially important biology relating to ribosomal RNAs? Um, which of course, yeah, probably sometimes is true. Um, and so, so some people spend their whole lives studying ribosomal RNAs, but there's like really important genes. Um, and so it's one of the like really common and fundamental biases of the whole concept of most RNA-seq experimentation is that it starts with this sort of unideal um, manipulation of the transcriptome of your cells that you're basically introducing this step that says like throw away a huge chunk of all of the RNA that's there and if you could if you could not do that and still have the the data production and analysis um, be feasible I think it would be desirable for sure but we're, I think we're just not really at the stage where it's feasible because of the, it's already going to cost you several hundred dollars to produce RNA, each RNA-seq library just sequencing the 2 to 3% of species that aren't ribosomal RNA. So times by, you know, 50 to, to get that unbiased pr picture. And then the file sizes are already, you know, big. So that part of it goes up too. Um, I th so I think that if you, again, and this has become, I think, fairly consistent. So if you sent all of your samples to the same core and they processed them in a consistent and reliable way, they, they did this ribosomal re reduction, but it's not absolute. It's a, it's a partial um, enrichment for things that aren't ribosomal RNAs. And so I think that as long as it's done fairly consistent, you can still look at the ribosomal RNA readout because you'll still get lots of lots and lots of <laughs> RNA coming through. And so you can probably still get decent differential expression uh, estimates as long as you, you, know, you did it consistently. Use the same RNA reduction procedure for each sample. Yeah. It's mostly just two genes that you're repeating, right? The large and the small. And since they've been studied so much, isn't it just easier to do PCR if you're just interested in those two genes to validate your findings? I don't feel. I feel like I don't know enough about ribosomal <laughs> RNA biology to comment with with any like, like strong opinions on that. Right? But I mean, there are there are actually a lot of ribosomal RNA species, and we're yeah, like you say, we're mostly just depleting those two that are really really highly abundant. 
But even that, I feel like, is somewhat of an oversimplification of the situation, that they have a lot of homology to each other. And so what is actually happening during that depletion is probably affecting quite a few transcripts. And it yeah, varies from species to species. And so I suspect that a ribosomal RNA biologist would be somewhat horrified to just not to throw away that information or just kind of like brush it off. But I'm not one of those. So I guess I'll just brush it off. <laughs> no. Good. All right. Um, how much depth? So I'm sure like five of you at least are going to ask about your this question about your experiments in the next couple days since this always happens. Um, so we, we, can, we can totally do that. And it really depends on your uh, experimental conditions, but some of the, the factors that you might think about are what kind of analysis you're going to do. This is probably the biggest one in some ways. So if you're really just looking for a gene expression readout that's sort of comparable to, say, like an expression microarray would be, that places the least demands on the amount of data you need to produce. And there's some, you know, pretty good papers out there that basically say, you know, something in the range of 25 million reads is sufficient to get a pretty robust gene expression signature out of your samples. And in the era of, you know, in a situation where you have finite resources, which is everyone has finite resources, and you have to make a choice between how many biological replicates to include and how much money to spend sequencing each of those replicates, um, there's this trade-off where if you just want a gene expression signature, you might be better off statistically to just do, you know, a smaller number of reads on a larger number of samples could be way a way better val uh, sort of value. Um, but if you want to really resolve all of the you know, structures of all of the transcripts, if you want to do mutation calling, if you want to verify the expression status of SNPs or point mutations in your RNA, that places a much greater demand on the coverage achieved for each sample. And so in that scenario, you're probably looking at more like 50 to 75 to 100 million reads per sample to, to get kind of a really robust picture of the transcriptome. And of course, all of these, these sort of those like very off the cuff uh, recommendations depend on a lot of factors uh, relating to the things we've been talking about, like how good did your ribosomal RNA reduction step work, um, and how much input material did you have, and how complex is the transcriptome in your sample, and so forth. So probably the, the, the more pragmatic way to approach this question is to identify publications that already did something in a similar system that you can use as kind of a starting point. So other publications that involve your species or the kinds of cons comparisons or cell types that you're using. And even better than that, do a pilot experiment where you spend a little bit more money on a small number of samples and you spend some time analyzing the data. Maybe you do some downsampling experiments. You try to dial in you know, what amount of data seems to be giving me uh, a, a robust readout for my actual experimental conditions in my hands uh, with my samples and so forth. Um, the good news is that the, the amount of data that comes off an Illumina instrument just keeps going up and up and up. Um, so uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to produce a, a large amount of data. So that 100 million reads, if you kind of want to go for the sort of gold level of, of RNA-seq, that amount is getting cheaper and cheaper. And it's you know within the reach of many labs as long as they're not needing to sequence a large number of samples. So. Yes, so the, the species makes a huge difference, right? So, a lot less, <laughs> I think. Yeah, so I'm not actually, I don't know if I've ever actually dug into this question before. Like, are there, it seems like there would be a kind of, at least back of the envelope approach to say comparing the size of the genome or number of transcripts. Um, that's sort of my sort of initial instinct is if I say 100 million for a human genome with 3 billion bases and 30,000 genes or the trans number of transcript transcribed bases as such and such, you could kind of extrapolate from there as a starting point, and that would probably get you into the right ballpark-ish. Um, and then again, you know, do some, do a bit of a pilot experiment to kind of dial it in a bit more. Only yeah, complexity size, and size. Yeah, and so I don't. Yeah, I haven't done any analysis like this, but the capacity of the Illumina instrument just seems like so massive compared to what you would need. Like, 
you're almost may wind up being limited by your ability to index broadly like yeah. and because the the amount of data you need is so small relative to what the instrument could produce even within one lane you need to be able to jam like hundreds of samples into that one lane uh, in order to get the sort of cost effectiveness of the platform and a lot of cores are limited in the amount of indexing you can do because they simply just don't support more than some of them support 96 index some some support 192 and some are getting up into the 300 ranges so you might have to also come up with a, your own indexing strategy potentially yeah. any other questions on that Yeah, so usually most um, sequencing cores will make more library than you, material than you actually need to sequence, and mostly they will either store that for some reasonable amount of time or give it back to you. And, you know, it's a cDNA library. If you store it properly, it gets good for years and years and years. And the now this sequencing platform is so consistent that, yeah, you can come back. And we've done this many times where we, we came back and added more data months or even years later. Yeah, it's definitely an option. Uh, mapping strategy, so we talked a bit about this. Um, long story short, if your reads are really short, you'll want to use a different aligner than the ones we're going to use, but pretty much, I mean, I think no one raised their hand for the less than 50 base pairs, so we kind of don't need to worry about that. You should make your reads longer so that you can use a, a splice aware aligner, uh, such as the ones that we're going to use. Um, High Sat and Star are probably the two that are really popular right now. Um, and then what if we don't have a, a reference species? So we're, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, number one, consider sequencing the genome of your species. Um, because the data production is so cheap now, that's actually becoming more feasible for small, even small labs to just basically make their own reference genome. Um, if that's not practical, a lot of people can get their hands on a transcript, uh, transcriptome reference. So that can be really useful. Uh, and then uh, the first two days, we're not going to talk uh, about de novo transcriptome but analysis, but Brian's going to cover uh, transcript, de novo transcriptome analysis on the third day. So you can, even if you don't have a reference transcriptome, uh, you could assemble uh, one from the data uh, and then use that as a basis for downstream analysis. Uh, that was just a sort of sampling of some of the common questions we've encountered over the years. Um, on the wiki, which we'll show you uh, in a second, uh, there's more, uh, a lot more of these example questions and answers. Um, 